Hello, I'm Mr. Eliasson, and welcome to World History. Today we're going to continue our story of the European Re Re uh, Renaissance and Reformation by bringing in our good friends Marty Luther and Henry VIII and talking about how they and their religious revelations for very, very different reasons transformed the religious landscape of Europe. So let's dive in. Here are our basic objectives for today, so pause and make sure you can take them in. And now we're going to dive into our story. So as you hopefully remember from previous lessons, the Catholic Church of the Middle Ages wasn't the most responsive and nurturing institution. Uh, for a lot of people, uh, for especially for a lot of common people, the Catholic Church didn't really do much for them. A lot of the services were performed in Latin, which no one could speak. A lot, of the, a lot of the priests got their jobs through simony, bribing church officials in order to get positions. And so many of them didn't know how to properly perform the services. And a lot of them were illiterate too. And so what you ended up having was priests who couldn't speak Latin giving services in fake Latin that they were mostly making up by mumbling nonsense words to congregations of, un, of illiterate peasants who didn't know the difference and couldn't, under, couldn't have understood it even if it was real Latin with it which it wasn't. So that's not super useful. These priests were somewhat uh, self-conscious about this whole thing. And so as shown in this drawing here, they often would drape a cloth across the whole front of the church. So not only could the parishioners not understand a single word they were saying, but they couldn't see them either. So you go and sit in a church and listen to a guy mumble nonsense Latin for several hours uh, while staring at a draped cloth that obscures him from view. Not exactly a particularly uh, religiously inspiring experience. People reacted in a bunch of ways to this. Uh, one way was rosary beads. People would uh, have these beads that they would go through a series of prayers in their heads as they sort of moved the beads through their hands. This was not something that the Catholic Church actually pushed originally. It was something that individuals came up with because they were super bored listening to mumbled Latin and staring at a cloth for several hours. But the other thing that kind of upset people is a lot of these priests were also not particularly good moral examples. Uh, a lot of them took on wives, which is totally a no-no in Catholicism, or fathered children, which is even worse if you know anything about the vows that priests take. And then, uh, and they would often uh, try to extort money from their parishioners, uh, demanding tithes or payments, which would then go to mostly uh, improving their own lifestyle and really doing very nothing, very little for the common people. And so the Catholic Church of the late Middle Ages wasn't a super useful institution for most people in Europe. And so it's understandable that there'd be a variety of people who would be pushing for reform and change. One of these people, and the most influential of them, he's of course not the first, we talked about Erasmus, and there's a variety of other precursors to Luther, but because this is a survey honors world history course, uh, we're just hitting the highlights. So Martin Luther was a young man of a sort of upwardly middle class family. His parents desperately wanted him to be a lawyer, but he was going to school for lawyering and he didn't super like it, and then one day he was caught in a terrible thunderstorm. He was terrified that he was going to be killed. He threw himself on the ground and pledged himself to God that if God spared him from this horrible thunderstorm, he would become a priest, give up lawyering, and uh, devote himself to religiosity. So he survived the thunderstorm, told his dad that he was quitting lawyer school, which you know upset his dad pretty substantially, and joined a monastery to become a monk. The problem with Luther being a monk is he wasn't a super good monk. The church at the time, as we noted, had a bunch of issues, and Luther did a very poor, or Luther went to the church searching, searching for answers about salvation, about sin, about life, and the church that he went to had very few answers for him. Luther was constantly terrified that he was going to hell and that he was never going to be good enough for God to get into heaven, and the church really offered him nothing for this. The bishop uh, over Luther's church was a guy named Albert, who uh, got his job. Uh, he was a 14-year-old who took out a massive loan from a German bank to pay the bribes to make himself become the bishop and then immediately realized he couldn't pay these loans back and so decided to try to find a way to use his position as a bishop to extort enough money to pay back the loans that he took out to become a bishop in the first place. Yeah, it's a, it seems like a good motivation. It seems totally reasonable. So what he came up with is 
The Catholic Church already had this practice of selling indulgences. These were pieces of paper that you could buy that would forgive certain sins and lessen your time in purgatory. So what, they, what he decided is Albert here contacted the Pope, and the Pope and him came up with an agreement that they were going to have a super indulgence-a-thon in Wittenberg, in this area of Germany that Luther was from. And they were going to sell as many indulgences as possible, and then they'd split the money two ways. Half of it would go to Albert in order for him to pay off these loans, and half of it would go to the Pope for him to build his beautiful new cathedral, St. Peter's Cathedral, in the, in the Vatican City. And so they'd split the money, and they brought in this super indulgence salesman, a guy named Johannes Teitzel. He was like the primo indulgence salesman of the day. He sold indulgence. He was he could sell indulgences to everybody. He had this awesome advertising jingle that said, quote, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory into heaven springs. It rhymes. And, uh, and then he'd, he would offer these indulgences. Here's one of his indulgences that says, In the authority of all the saints and in compassion towards thee, I absolve thee from all sins and misdeeds and remit all punishment for ten days. So ten fewer days in purgatory, the waiting room to get into heaven, for all sins that you've done. So that's cool. So a get out of purgatory free card. And he would go and just sell these indulgences, walk up and down the streets harassing people. And most importantly, he would try to sell indulgences to people for their deceased relatives. So say your beloved grandfather just died. You don't want your beloved grandfather to be languishing in purgatory or, heaven forbid, hell forever, right? So why don't you buy this indulgence for me and I can get your grandfather out of purgatory or hell and into heaven for a small fee? And so he started selling these indulgences, and to say that Luther disagreed with this practice would be a pretty substantial understatement. Luther, find, this was finally the breaking point for Luther, and he came up with a series of criticisms of the Catholic Church that he called the 95 Theses, which Lore tells us he nailed to the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral. Uh, more accurately, he probably just passed it on to his superior, who then passed it on to the Pope. Uh, these 95 criticisms included, you know, attacking the Pope for his hypocrisy, attacking the indulgence crisis, attacking, you know, the priests for being illiterate and mumbling, basically calling out all of the things that the Catholic Church was doing ridiculously. And, uh, of course, you'd expect the Catholic Church would take these and say, oh, yeah, you know, we, we, have, we really haven't been serving the people all that well. Let's reform the church to have it be more useful. Yeah. Not a thing. And so uh, here's... Here, so in the end, they refused to listen to Luther, and so Luther decided to go directly to the people himself, printing things like, quote, It is pure invention that popes, bishops, priests, and monks are to be called the spiritual estate. Princes, lords, artisans, and former are the, tempor are the temporal estate. All Christians are truly of the spiritual estate, and among them there is no difference at all in that office. So there's nothing special about priests. You should be able to read the Bible for yourself and interpret it. Quote, and then, from this, anyone can see how a Christian is free of all things and over all things, so that all he needs no works to make him righteous and save him, since faith alone abundantly confers all these things. And so in the, on Christian liberty, Luther threw back a bunch of the Catholic teachings about sacraments. The Catholics had taught that in order to get into heaven, you needed to confess your sins, you needed to get repentance, uh, you needed to do good works to uh, repent for your sins, and you know a priest needed to be the intermediary in that process. And Luther said, no, it's not about your relationship with the priest that matters, it's your relationship with God. And God's, through your faith in God and God's grace, that's where salvation happens. All the rest of this stuff that the Catholic Church has created is nonsense and you shouldn't listen to it. And so, if you had to guess how the Catholic Church felt about Luther directly attacking the very core of their philosophy and religion, and of course their control over people's lives in Europe, they were not happy. Luther also taught that the Bible alone, so the three principles of, of Luther's teachings are one, sola fide, faith alone, sola, so, uh, sola fide, sola gratia, grace alone, and sola scriptura, the Bible alone. So he taught that the Bible itself is the only source of religious texts. All those doctrines, all those papal dictates that the Pope was putting out, that's nonsense. The Pope is just a dude. He doesn't have any special religious connection to God. You, you, the stuff that you interpret in the Bible is just as legitimate as the stuff that the Pope interprets. And this created the idea of the priesthood of all believers, the idea that every Christian themselves had the power of a priest to talk to God and interpret the Bible. 
So, quote, that means that it is not enough for people to comprehend and recite these parts according to the words only, but young people should be made to attend to the preaching, especially during the time which is devoted to the catechism, that they may hear it explained and understand what every part contains and may give a correct answer so the preaching may not be without profit and fruit. Basically, everyone needs to be able to understand and interpret the Bible, and all interpretations are equally valid. The popes at this time were not thrilled by this, uh, for what I hope are obvious reasons. Uh, they had been, most of them, from the wealthy Medici family of Florence, who had purchased their way in with massive amounts of a combination of uh, textile and banking money. And they were spending a lot of that, they were spending a lot of the wealth of the church on fancy cathedrals, on Leonardo, or, and on uh, Michelangelo painting the, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, on beautiful sculptures, things like that. And so they sent Luther a, a, a cease and desist letter. And when he refused, uh, they sent him a papal bull of excommunication and ordered all Luther's books burned. Luther defiantly responded that, quote, since they have burned my books, I burn theirs. The canon law was included because it makes the Pope a god on earth. So far, I have merely, merely fooled with the business of, of the Pope. All my articles are condemned by the Antichrist are Christian. So calling the Pope the Antichrist, he's pretty pissed at this point. And seldom has the Pope overcome anyone with scripture and reason. So throwing some shade at the Pope, burns the Pope, pape, Pope's letter of excommunication and goes on teaching. They, hold a, they end up holding a trial. The Holy Roman Empire, Charles, uh, pulls Luther in front of a council where he argues his point of view. The church argues their point of view. And in the end, Luther has to go into hiding as in, although he is not convicted at the Diet of Worms, he is concerned that church forces will find him, arrest him, and kill him. And so he goes and hides in, a, in an estate of a wealthy German noble. But Luther's ideas at this point have now got a public hearing and starts to spread. Luther also starts translating the Bible into German so the common people can read it. And this becomes a clear point of contention with the church going forward. One of the places that Luther's ideas spread to is to England. <coughs> the King of England, Henry VIII, had become king when his brother Edward died. And he had married a woman, his brother's uh, fiance, Catherine of Aragon. After a few years married to Catherine, it was a very unhappy marriage. Luther, uh, Henry had not yet been able to have a male heir, and so he had no one to sort of uh, take over his legacy, and so he wanted a divorce from Catherine, believing it was her fault he hadn't sired a dude yet. So he wrote to the Pope. The Pope said, okay, fine, we could set aside that marriage. And so then he married someone else. The, uh, he married a, a lady named Anne Boleyn, who was one of the people who worked in the palace. Then Anne Boleyn did not give him an heir, and he thought he was cheating on her. She thought, sorry, he thought she was cheating on him. So he wanted to divorce her. He wrote to the Pope again and asked for a second divorce, and the Pope said no. Henry, in response, decided to form his own church, the Anglican Church, which is exactly like the Catholic Church, or very similar to the Catholic Church, except that instead of a Pope in charge of the church, the king is in charge of the church. Most of the rest of the rituals are the same. So Henry then granted himself a divorce and created this new church. From there, he would then go on to marry four different women and divorce them, eventually getting a young son named Edward out of the deal. But the big break, of course, was he would then force all of England to move from the Catholic Church to this new church, the Church of England or the Anglican Church. Some people were okay with the, the uh, some people were okay with the switch. Our good friend Sir Thomas More, author of Utopia, was not okay, and he was burned at the stake as punishment. In the end, the act of supremacy set the King of England on the top of this new Anglican Church. But in the aftermath of Henry's death, there was a massive succession crisis. His young son Edward, that he went through so much to have, died young. He was then succeeded, but succeeded by his daughter Mary, who he had had with his first wife, the Catholic uh, Catherine. Mary was Catholic and engaged in a massive purge of English society, of all Protestants. But then she died and was replaced by Elizabeth, who then tried to end the religious persecution. We'll spend more time talking about, uh, about Elizabeth later when we get into the English monarchs, but just know she's going to use English as a language of prayer in England, and she's going to attempt to not harass people as much about religion, which sort of stabilized her kingdom and English society. The Pope, of course, was not satisfied by this and excommunicated her. <laughs> 